Hello, this is Matt on the Moon Lambo channel. Ripple is positioning XRP as a bridge currency. That's not news. We already known that. We've known that for quite a while. But what is lesser known is that upon XRP's creation, it, there was no designated use case. It was just built as a better version of Bitcoin. And then they thought, huh, maybe we can find something to do with this. And, um, and so there's this piece from dailyhodl.com titled XRP was created before use case uh, for crypto asset was discovered, says Ripple Chief Technology Officer. So, of course, that would be uh, David Schwartz, who is a co-creator of the XRP ledger itself. And, uh, and I've, I've been aware of this. In fact, shortly after entering the space, I remember watching a video. It was actually Brad Garlinghouse, and he was speaking publicly somewhere, and he was talking about how they were trying to decide what direction to go as a, as a, as a company in the early days of Ripple and how to uh, utilize XRP most successfully. And so they were considering all sorts of things. And in fact, um, you know, it was um, they were even considering going down a completely different path, which would have been smart contracts. And uh, Vitalik Buterin, who was the creator of uh, Ethereum, he he actually was um, he was I can't remember the whole story. It's been a while since I read it, but I know that he was staying on the couch of Stefan Thomas, who used to be Ripple CTO uh, back in the early days when it because it was actually Ripple people that uh, that came up with the idea for you know the cryptocurrency with smart contracts. That's where Vitalik Buterin got his his idea. It's it, for for Ethereum. It was from Ripple. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff, right? And and so uh, there, there are all sorts of routes that uh, that Ripple could have gone, but they ended up choosing to position XRP as a bridge currency because they kind of thought that uh, even if smart contracts make sense, that wasn't the right order to do things. You really need to have what is now widely known today as the Internet of Value. That's uh, you know the idea that uh, it's going to be as easy to move money around the planet as it is to just send an email. And so they thought, well, there's some interesting applications for uh, you know smart contracts, other things, but if you don't have the internet of value it's effectively, you know, it's it's not as useful. And so let's just let's just go go about this in this order. So the, that's uh, the beginning phase of how they ended up positioning XRP as a bridge currency. But, uh, but before I dive into this piece any further here, though, if you would please delicately tap that like button, I would certainly appreciate it. And also go ahead and subscribe to the Moon Lambo channel. It don't cost nothing, so why the hell not? And uh, so this is a really cool piece here, and I, I think that it's widely um, f f within the XRP community misunderstood because it, I see people write stuff like this all the time, not knowing any better that um, XRP was designed for this specific use case. You know, be, being a bridge currency, it's just not not actually true though. Uh, Ripple's chief technology officer David Schwartz is offering new insight on how XRP came into existence. On the Modern CTO podcast, Schwartz says XRP was created before its developers had any idea what its primary use case would be. And here's a quote from David Schwartz now. Well, the key difference in the very first animating idea for what eventually became what we now call the XRP ledger was the proof of work. The mining in Bitcoin wasn't the secret sauce. We had an alternate theory, and our theory was that what made Bitcoin so amazing was not the proof of work, not mining. What made Bitcoin so amazing was the fact that all the data was public and all the transaction rules were public. So you don't have to ask anybody else if a transaction is valid or if somebody has a particular amount of Bitcoins or anything. Everybody can do that for themselves. We felt that uh, the, we felt that that was the key innovation to Bitcoin. So we replaced the proof of work with what you uh, would call a distributed agreement algorithm, which is an algorithm that is faster and doesn't have the sort of uh, sort of power consumption. And so and, and I would say also, I mean, f fair enough what David Schwartz is stating there, but, you know, the mining, mining in and of itself, I, I don't care about it's it's um, I was trying to was like that's. Saying something like that is a great sin if, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, but I'm not. I'm not a maximalist of Bitcoin. But it's really more so what what uh, mining did, which was uh, solve the double spend problem. You know, the, the idea that if you have a Bitcoin, you can't send it to Bob and also send it to Jane and then uh, spend, spend it twice because that would kind of ruin the system. And so mining is, is, is what um, resulted in that particular fix. But as David cited here, there's a different algorithm within the XRP ledger and it allows for the same solution. It's just much more efficient. 
Um, now, after XRP was built, Schwartz says the next step became to figure out how it could be used. Isn't it funny that this technology was created? And they're like, well, it doesn't do anything. I don't know if it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to do with it, but it's pretty cool, right? It's a faster version of Bitcoin, which also does nothing. <laughs> it's kind of funny to think about it like that, but that is what happened. Um, but uh, here's another quote from David Schwartz now. Once you say, okay, we've built this new system that works, the next question to ask logically is, what is it good for? And I gotta pause right there. You would think that people might ask that before building it. You'd be wrong. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Uh, this quote continues now. Uh, what are its advantages? <clears throat> Sometimes it might have no advantages. If you invented a new material, but it's really heavy, really expensive, makes water damages, it's not very sturdy. Oh, well, I've developed this new material, but I can't find a use case. It's kind of the reverse. Usually you start with the use case, but when you're building something totally new, you have no idea what people are going to use it for. All you can do is build it and see what it's good for. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then peace continues. Uh, Schwartz says Ripple ultimately decided XRP would be used for international payments given its speed, low transaction cost, and the significant amount of issues plaguing the current banking system. And so, while well, again, it's not the case that XRP was built specifically with this in mind, it is the case that XRP is perfectly suited to fix the train wreck that is the world of cross-border payments and settlement. <clears throat> you know, it, it's it's perfectly sort of, uh, 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 suited for this this use case. And so I'm glad they found the solution here. And it's so amazing that, uh, the, although of course XRP, it, it's amazing today, actually being used in the commercial production of on-demand liquidity, uh, even just the messaging portion, which doesn't utilize XRP, uh, you know, with the, 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 the traditional financial system, just through what Swift offered, we, the experience was so bad that even just having a better messaging platform was a product in and of itself. So given the tremendous friction and pain points associated with this, uh, they, they, they realized, huh, well, you know, people are trading XRP. You can just tap into that liquidity. It makes things super fast as far as moving money, converting from one fiat currency to another. And so here's, a, here's one last quote in this piece from David Schwartz. Uh, the use case that we settled on was payments, particularly international payments, simply because that's where there's pain. So you want to find a problem that people agree is a problem, and ideally, the worse the problem, the less perfect you have to be to be better than whatever they've got. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it's payments and settlements, uh, cross-border payment settlement. It was that bad, right? And this quote continues, though. Um, international, international payments were so bad. Particular things like remittances were just so bad that we could still be pretty bad and still be better. Now, to be clear, it's not that they were aiming to not do well. He's just making a point that it's so bad, any little bit of improvement would be well-received. That's what he was actually getting at. Then he, uh, he continues. When you are just starting out, people are going to have to take a risk. What if the whole system just breaks one day? Or what if uh, regulations destroy it? You want to pick a problem that is really painful for people and payments are really painful. If you compare sending a payment to sending an email, you know you could make a long list of all the differences. So that was sort of the direction that we launched on. Exactly. And uh, moving money around the planet, as it turns out, it's very painful. Uh, you know, you got, what was it, like a 5 or 6% failure rate? And when you start, like, when, you, when you're a customer and you, you say, I want to move my, uh, my, my United States dollars to so-and-so country, you don't know how much it's going to cost by the time it's all said and done because there are so many uh, intermediaries, in the course, uh, intermediaries in the correspondent banking system. It's just kind of like... Eh, shrug, shrug your shoulders, hope it goes well. And then if it doesn't, then uh, given that there's uh, there's not bi-directional communication, it's just kind of pushing out, just kind of like you imagine you're putting a stamp on an envelope and mailing it out. It's just unidirectional messaging. You don't know if it fails. You have to like proactively reach out. It's, it's, you're not, it's, it's not like you typed in a wrong email address and you're immediately alerted. Uh, that uh, your, your your email didn't go through. No, 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 no. You're not notified. <laughs> and so there's just, there's so many pain points associated with this, and it requires all sorts of layers of middle management that frankly just aren't needed anymore. So that's that's like if you're wondering where are the savings actually coming in. Well, a huge chunk of it is removing the human labor from all of this. 
A lot of this can be, be more so automated, and you don't need all these people in the middle taking their cut uh, along the way. It's, it's just because really the correspondent banking system is just a chain of bilateral banking relationships. That's it. But uh, as Brad Garlandhouse ardently stated, there's a better way to do this. So cool story. Feel free to drop a comment below, but that is it for this one. I am not a financial advisor. Do not buy or sell anything because of anything that I say or write. That would be a very, very, very bad idea. Until next time, to the moon, Lambeau.